All right, rotator cuff arthropathy is the next new topic. It's actually not that new a topic, however, because I covered this in our previous webinar. Uh, but because it's um, tested so uh, often, Derek asked us to include this, and I think it's reasonable to have it uh, again. But we will go through this fairly quickly. Uh, this is DJD resulting from massive cuff tears where we get proximal migration, as shown here. Uh, we get abnormal glenohumeral wear and abnormal acromial wear. It's characterized by cuff insufficiency, cartilage destruction, superior migration, subchondral osteoporosis, and eventually humeral head collapse. So it's a pretty bad disease. Uh, usually females greater than males in the seventh decade of life are more common uh, and more common in the dominant shoulder, although we see many patients with bilateral disease. Uh, they have massive cuff tears. Rheumatoid disease is a risk factor, as are crystalline induced arthropathies and hemophiliacs. <clears throat> um, a lot of mechanical factors that lead to this, as we've uh, discussed already. Uh, there are some nutritional factors and the crystalline induced arthropathy. So all of these can have a multifactorial impact uh, on the glenohumeral joint. <coughs> Uh, the the uh, C-Bauer classification is nice because it basically breaks them down into centered and stable, that's the type 1A, uh, centered and medialized, that's the 1B, decentered and uh, limited stability is a 2A, and then 2B is the worst. These are the decentered and unstable with gross anterior superior escape, as shown in this uh, patient who is one of my 75-year-old uh, patients who came with that uh, X-ray. Uh, these patients have pain, obviously. They have weakness uh, and subjective stiffness. <clears throat> they will often get impressive fluid collections because there's nothing, uh, there's no longer any capsule and the fluid just is free flowing. So they'll get uh, fluid that can be all around, either through the AC joint or through the entire joint. Uh, they get anterior superior escape. Um, and of course, they get pseudoparalysis. Um, external rotation lag sign uh, is a great way to identify. Uh, pay, uh, patient who has a massive cuff tear, uh, especially with the uh, infraspinatus, and so we bring the arm into external rotation. Uh, the patient can't hold it there, and it falls back to neutral or beyond. Um, and the hornblower sign is in uh, inability to externally rotate with the arm in abduction, and the arm falls down uh, into an internally rotated position. Uh, sorry, I don't have a picture of that here. Uh, classic x-ray findings are going to be what we've talked about. Uh, we're going to see acromial acetabularization and humeral head femoralization. So we lose the tuberosity contour uh, and the entire humeral head starts to get rounded, looking very much like a femur. Be very cognizant of how thin the acromion gets. That has a big impact on our concern for later acromial spine fractures uh, and so something to just keep in mind. MRI is going to show the classic findings of an irreparable massive tear with profound retraction to beyond the glenoid, severe fatty infiltration with almost no muscle left, uh, and um, significant and static proximal humeral migration. Those are not findings you want if you have a ro rotator cuff repair scheduled for that patient. Here you see the classic Goutalier uh, 4 atrophy of the supra and infraspinati. Remember, Guttallier's classification actually was used to characterize CT arthrograms because that's what they got in France uh, at the time more prominently uh, and commonly than MRI, but we now use it um, routinely for MRI description as well. Non-operative management is very appropriate early on. Activity modification, injections, physical therapy, uh, and the like. Uh, deltoid and rotator cuff strengthening, or deltoid uh, strengthening uh, program. Ofer Levy from uh, Reading, England, uh, uh, has a nice paper on how he took pseudoparalytic patients, had them uh, go on a specific deltoid strengthening rehab program, and actually converted many of the uh, so-called pseudoparalytic shoulders to non-pseudoparalytic shoulders. So you don't have to operate on everybody and certainly can try a non-operative approach. <clears throat> Arthroscopic debridement is, is really pretty controversial. This is not going to give lasting and durable results and really should only be used in a patient where they have severe pain, they're unwilling or you're unwilling to do a reverse for a variety of different clinical reasons, uh, and they failed every reasonable non-operative approach, and they understand the risks that this will not have long-lasting duration. If you have that very unique patient population, then an arthroscopic debridement may be appropriate for you to consider. 
Uh, hemiarthroplasty used to be the mainstay before we had reverse total shoulder replacement. Uh, in this day and age, it's really hard to defend doing a hemiarthroplasty for most patients because we're going to end up doing a reverse. Now, if you have a very young patient, you may make an argument that a stemless hemiarthroplasty uh, or a resurfacing arthroplasty may be appropriate, uh, but that's something that's controversial. And for the most part, uh, test question-wise, uh, reverse is going to likely be the right answer in uh, probably the majority of situations. Uh, reverse shoulder arthroplasty, cuff tear arthropathy is the most common indication, uh, preferably in the elderly, lower demand patient, uh, and they have anterior superior escape. You must have a functioning deltoid, you must have a functioning axillary nerve, or else obviously you can't do a reverse replacement. The concerns we have um, are long-term outcome, as this article indicates, and then the risk of inferior scapular notching with poor technique, and that's been discussed quite a bit in the literature in the last uh, decade. If you have a patient who has not only pseudoparalysis but a hornblower sign, and they are very concerned that they have this hornblowers, meaning that they have an internal rotation uh, contracture or, or they fall into obligate internal rotation when they try to raise their arm, then that's a patient that you should strongly consider a concurrent latissimus dorsi transfer. Latissimus dorsi is a very easy transfer from a deltopectoral approach. It's right there, and here you see on the right, this is a cadaveric section where we've taken the, the uh, trapezius uh, from off its insertion, wrapped it around, and here's a clinical scenario in my patient who had that very clinical scenario where he had very significant horn blowers, and it's an easy uh, transfer to do uh, at the same time uh, as the reverse. So something to keep in mind for those patients with horn blowers. <clears throat> PEC transfer uh, is going to be uh, rarely done uh, in this situation, but we're going to take the upper border, border or the whole PEC tendon and transfer this, uh, again, underneath the strap muscles uh, often. Uh, if you do, but again, we're going to dissect out the musculocutaneous nerve because that's been discussed as the most common complication uh, with PEC transfers. Resection arthroplasty is going to be a, a um, uh, salvage operation for osteomyelitis and infection. Uh, we're not going to do any glenoid resurfacing. We're not doing any total shoulder replacement for anybody with cuff tear arthropathy. If you enjoyed this video, please consider leaving a like. We'd love to hear your thoughts and what you'd like to see next in the comments. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel and follow us on social media.